you were going to be talking about vasopressors when and why, right? That's what we're going to be talking about. Correct. All right. I'm excited because uh, I always thought uh, Levafed was the answer for everything, but uh, but you're going to tell me different. Sort of. It is almost <laughs> always the answer to everything. <laughs> But I think there's so many choices that are out there that sometimes people get really tripped up and they want to know what medication do I use in every situation. So I want to give a very 30,000 foot view to people so that they can understand the difference between the vasopressors that are, that are out there, the anotropes and how they put together. And I'll just give you what I use in my everyday practice. You know, some style will differ and, and that's okay. As long as you know the evidence behind everything, uh, what you choose to do with it is your own business. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do this in crit bits fashion. Anyone that knows what crit bits is, it's just me scribbling on a piece of paper. It's on YouTube. It's a channel that I like to run. So I'm going to try and do this out. This is the first time, the first time I'm ever doing crit bits live. So let's see how this goes. So essentially, the, we're going to go in order of least preferable to the most preferable vasopressor. And we can't start off uh, any talk on vasopressors without talking about dopamine. And I'll tell you that dopamine is a drug that is looking for an indication at this point in time. The used to be that dopamine was kind of similar to norepinephrine uh, when the surviving sepsis guidelines came out, but more and more shows that they're actually not equivalent. And the reason why dopamine is not such a good drug is because it causes arrhythmias for patients. Um, it causes uh, atrial and ventricular arrhythmias, which have been associated with harm. So if you put a gun to my head and said, you have to use dopamine, which patients would you use it on? I would use it for patients who are hypotensive and bradycardic as well because you would use the side effect, which we don't like to do, you'd use the side effect of increasing heart rate to help this person out. So someone who's hypotensive in parts of their bradycardia maybe would find a use for dopamine, but to be honest with you, it's just a drug for me that I'm just hardly ever reaching for. And just for the record, we can put it out there, renal dose dopamine, hopefully no one believes that that's a thing anymore. Um, it's completely garbage. So let's talk about things that we'll, we will actually use. And the next thing we'll talk about is phenylephrine um, or Neo. And this is basically alpha. As Peter W says, it's alpha in a bottle. So that's all it does. And the good about it is that, you know, when you're talking about vascular tissue after the heart, the arterial system, Alpha is going to cause you to get vasoconstriction, which is what you want when you're vasodilated. The downside, something we often don't talk about, is the fact when you have somebody who's sick or uh, they're sick, they may have a, a drop in their cardiac output. Now, that might be native to them. They may have a low cardiac output to start with. It might be the illness that's causing their cardiac output to go down. So their heart's already not happy. And now if you increase the afterload, on that heart by trying to do peripheral vasoconstriction on the arteries, what happens is this heart has to work even harder to eject out a cardiac output. And so what this winds up doing is decreasing your cardiac output. So it's not a drug that I will routinely grab for early on. Now, I wouldn't say it's a drug that I never grab for because there are two indications I can think of where it's helpful. The first one is if I have somebody who I'm intubating with rapid sequence intubation, and we know that giving patients sedatives, which we should be doing, sedative hypnotics for intubation, many of those are vasodilatory, even ketamine. So um, it's a talk for a different day, but every sedative hypnotic has a certain dose that you should be giving your patients. But I like to have neosinephrine ready to go because if that person drops their pressure, I can bring their pressure back up because I know this is just a temporary phenomenon of peri-intubation hypotension. Now, theoretically, the same thing could apply. Increasing afterload could worsen the, the cardiac output, but we don't have any data that tells us one way or the other. So if you're using neosinephrine for peri-intubation, I think that's just fine. Theoretical um, at the best. The other place where I use it routinely is if I have somebody who's AFib, they're hypotensive, and I know I have to cardiovert them, but they're awake. And I hate cardiovascular people who are awake. I want to give them analgesia. I want to give them sedatives, but I know that's going to drop their pressure. So what I'll do is I'll give them neosinephrine because what's good about that is there's no beta in here that's not going to affect the atrial tachycardia, bring their blood pressure up, give them sedation, 
and then I cardiovert them. So that's where I use phenylephrine um, for the most part. And then of course, if you have somebody who's really sick, who's on some of the other drugs we'll be talking about, and you're just throwing a Hail Mary, of course, you'll put them on phenylephrine um, as part of their vasopressor regimen. So we talked about dopamine, not so much. We talked about phenylephrine, maybe a few indications. Let's start getting to ones that are the workhorses for what we do. The first one I'll talk about is epinephrine. Epinephrine has alpha and it has beta. What's interesting about epinephrine is at lower doses, beta is greater than alpha. And as you increase your dose, it starts to become more alpha it's greater than beta. And so at lower doses, it's an anotrope, helps the heart squeeze when you have low cardiac output. And at higher doses, it increases your afterload, less so beta. Now, epinephrine is not a bad drug. In some places like Australia, it's their primary go-to drug. But there are some limitations. The first is that the beta can cause arrhythmias. And the second is it causes a type B lactic acidosis. So if you use lactate as part of your resuscitation to follow things along, you might see a metabolically induced lactic acidosis that can kind of screw with things if you're following that stuff. But epinephrine is a good drug. I also like to use it as a peri-intubation push dose presser because What's nice about it is that it's not just alpha, you get your afterload, but you're also increasing cardiac contractility. So it's a little bit more balanced of a vasopressor in the sense that you increase afterload, but you're also increasing contractility at the same clip. So I tend to use this for push those pressures. And then if we have somebody who is, um, who is hypotensive, um, you can add this on as well. Now, where do I use this exclusively? In two cases. The first case is if I have somebody who is an asthmatic, and we're talking severe life-threatening asthma because we need them to get their beta agonism and albuterol is not gonna to get to the terminal alveoli. They need something intravenously. And then the second thing is for anaphylaxis. That is the first drug that you wanna use as a drip in anaphylaxis, shock with anaphylaxis. So that's what you wanna do there, epinephrine, okay? So let's go ahead and move on and we'll talk about the next two drugs. And this paper is all recycled, so I don't want to get any crap in my email about me wasting paper. All recycled paper here at the Malmat household. We turn this into confetti later for the kids. All right, let's talk about the next drug, and that's norepinephrine. Let's see, norepinephrine. When I was training, my intensivist used to call this levofed. It's leave them dead. <laughs> well, it turns out this if you had to pick a vasopressor, if you're on a desert island, you can have only one vasopressor. This is the vasopressor that you want. It's got alpha. It's got beta. And it's a much more balanced version of this than epinephrine. Now, all the vasopressors probably do this, but some people think that norepinephrine does this better than anything else. And it increases not only arterial tone, so it increases afterload, but it also increases venous tone. Now, why would you need venous tone? You know, 75% of your blood volume right now is sitting, hanging out in veins and capacitance vessels in your mesentery and your legs, blood you're not really using. Well, what if when you're sick, you could call on that blood to get back as part of active circulation? And by using norepinephrine, you increase venous tone and that pulls that blood back into the circulation. It's almost like you're giving yourself an auto bolus rather than giving saline, which has its harms, you're giving your own blood back to circulation, helping people out. So that's a really nice feature about norepinephrine. And uh, study after study compared to other vasopressors shows that in sepsis, in cardiogenic shock, um, in most types of shocks, this is what you want to be grabbing for first. We also have the added benefit that we can run it peripherally. And I don't think this is controversial anymore. We have data that shows that you can run peripheral norepinephrine very safely for people. And sometimes this is all they need, just a little bit of afterload increase to make them better while the antibiotics and everything else that you're doing is kicking in. So norepinephrine is definitely key. The next drug that kind of goes with it is vasopressin. Vasopressin works on a completely different receptor. It works on the V1 receptors in the arteries. Now, the reason why these go together is because when you have a patient who's on norepinephrine, they're getting alpha, they're getting beta, it would be foolish to go ahead and give them uh, phenylephrine next because that's just more alpha. You're just working on more of the same receptor. Wouldn't it be cool if you can find another receptor on the vascular tissue 
that would work synergistically. And that's where vasopressin comes into play. And it would be great if it was only that, but vasopressin also works on the kidneys. It works on the adrenals. It works with cortisol, insulin, a whole bunch of things related to regulatory mechanisms in sepsis. So it's a really good drug. And there's an added benefit with vasopressin that we don't talk about enough. All these vasopressors, they will increase the arterial tone. And we typically think of arterial tone as systemic vascular resistance. But if you have a person who has pulmonary hypertension or RV dysfunction, what's going to happen is the peripheral vascular resistance is going to go up. Vasopressors, typically, the other ones will increase your, per, uh, your, I'm sorry, your pulmonary vascular resistance. That could make the right heart failure even worse vasopressin doesn't do it to the same degree as the other vasopressors. So if I have somebody who has pulmonary hypertension or RV dysfunction, I might grab for vasopressin first, but certainly I want to add it on early in my care of that patient because it doesn't increase the pulmonary vascular resistance as much as norepinephrine and the other ones do. So lots of benefits to it. And typically we start at 0.03, but I'll tell you, you can titrate it. There's no rules when it comes to vasopressin. Again, we can go into nuances in the chat. The other thing I'd like to say about vasopressin is when do you start it when you have a patient who's in sepsis? This is just eminence-based medicine, but I think most people agree. Once you get to norepinephrine, I'll say in the teens, so 10, 11, 12, whatever you're feeling like, I say 15, it's time to add on vasopressin and steroids and fludrocortisone. So that's how I manage vasopressin. And the last drug that I won't spend too much time on is um, angiotensin II or Giapriza. Um, that is a drug that I actually don't use very much because it costs a whole lot of money. And I don't have a lot of money in my hospital. Um, most places actually don't have this. This is a super expensive drug right now. And maybe when it comes off patent, it'll be helpful. It works synergistically with the other drugs and it works on the kidneys, just like vasopressin does. And in the Athos trial, it shows that there's, uh, there is some benefit and some sparing of norepinephrine when used in conjunction. So it's only been studied in sepsis and uh, vasodilatory shocks, so we'll just say distributive, and more studies are needed before this goes widespread. But I suspect we'll be seeing a lot more of this as the price starts to come down, and our experience and research shows that this is beneficial for our patients. So just to summarize very quickly, we talked about dopamine, no way, unless you have a person who's bradycardic and hypotensive. We talked about phenylephrine, that's alpha in a bottle. Again, it's for me, it's like third line if all these other things are in place, but typically I'll use it for peri-intubation hypotension or I'll use it for someone with AFib and hypotension. Norepinephrine, that's really our go-to and rightly so. It has alpha, has beta. It's a balanced vasopressor, so it doesn't uh, cause that strain on the heart that we talked about previously. And it also increases venous tone and you can run it peripherally. Vasopressin is great in conjunction with this. Remember, it's, it's uh, claim to fame is it doesn't increase pulmonary vascular resistance as much as the other drugs. And then angiotensin II, maybe one day will be um, affordable and something that we can add in to our arsenal. So 